Hello, welcome to another video of Valentum. First of all, please do read our disclaimer. Um, take a minute to pause the video and, and, and read it carefully. This is not, um, most importantly, this is not a recommendation to buy or sell any security. It's just a way to show how we analyze and, and, and we do the research of our, of our investments. So, um, welcome to this video. My name is Jesus Dominguez. I'm the manager of Valentum together with Luis de Blas. If you're familiar with us, you might have seen other videos like uh, the one we did on Global Dominion and on Regis, now called IWG. And uh, you can, and if you haven't seen them, you can check these videos in our channel in YouTube. Or, or accessing through the link um, through our webpage um, in www.valentum.es. Um, today we're going to present a new company in our portfolio. It's called SCS. It's um, a company uh, which is in the furniture sector in, in the UK and it's um, a very good example of, of how we analyze companies and, and what we look for. So let's start. Um, today is May 22nd, 2017, and these are the data of, of the company. Uh, just a, a quick picture. Um, it's a small company. It's a 62 million um, pound market cap with a low uh, average daily volume of around 60,000 shares and the closing price is uh, 1.55. As you can see here in the, in the table where we show the ratios, it's quite cheap. It trades at a P of 6.7 times, but it has a lot of net cash. So the P X cash is, is um, dramatically lower than that. And this can be seen at the same time in the EV to EBIT and EV to EBIT multiples. What we look for, and most importantly, is the free cash flow yield which is very high in this company, almost 25%, and it's crazy at levels of 50% when we look at it on, on a free cash flow on enterprise value. And as you can see, the company went public in 2015, almost two years, where not, not much has happened really, okay? So what is SCS? SCS uh, basically, uh, it's a retailer of furniture, basically sofas and flooring. But sofas is the, is the big thing and it's what, what they've done uh, for many years. Um, before I continue, I've divided the presentation into two parts. This is a quick overview in five minutes. So if anyone wants to stop after the five minutes. Um, and after that, we, we will have an, another part, which is a long play version of the, of the company where we try to dive into into the company in a more uh, deeply uh, analysis. Um, the company has 97 stores in the SCS um, uh, brand. Uh, it has 10 distribution centers and 28 stores in House of Fraser um, in the UK as a, as a matter of a concession. And the company does not manufacture. So uh, this means that it has several suppliers uh, which are which SCS is the main client for these suppliers, which is good, but SCS can profit through low fixed costs and uh, uh, um, a light asset-based uh, model. Um, given the way they work, they can have negative working capital because they cash in uh, the orders before they are manufactured and before they pay the, the supplier. And um, it's not the biggest company in the UK. The biggest company is DFS, which we also own. We bought both of them by the end of, of last year. We, we like both of them, but this one is, is cheaper and, and we prefer to do the analysis on this one. It's mostly UK. I say here it's only UK, but it has some stores in Spain as well, and, or sells through some stores in Spain. And most of their suppliers are UK based, though they source the, themselves part through, through Asia as well. Um, they don't own the stores, they've got operating leasings in, in the stores, it's a long-term leasing, 10, 15 years, and the products they sell are most oriented to, to middle to low class uh, population. Okay. Um, 
the company, and this is something that we like, went into bankruptcy in 2008, but the thing that we like most is that they went into bankruptcy mainly because the, the financiers of the suppliers stopped uh, financing them. So suddenly the suppliers said that they were not working anymore because they, they could not factor their invoices. Um, the financing for the clients also said if there's no financing for suppliers, we might stop as well. So the company had a solid balance sheet, but it, it was collapsing because um, because suppliers, well, credit insurance were, were, was just collapsing and, and cutting liquidity. So uh, a private equity firm, Sun Capital Partners, acquired the company in 2008, and none of the funds that they injected were finally used. This is a, a, a very good uh, data because the company was was sound and the management was sound and Sun Capital didn't have to to replace um, the management team. So several points that, that we like. Finally, in, in 2015, Sun Capital IPO'd the company at 1.75 and they still hold 41.6%. And since the IPO, the company, as you saw in the chart, hasn't done much, but it has paid dividends of 0.33 uh, pounds per share, which is almost a 20% um, payment. So, so, so it's been, it's been a good investment. It has net cash. It generates a lot of cash. So, so we like it. The, the main risk here is that it's a volatile and a seasonal business. And that's basically the main risk that, that we have to take into account. In terms of valuation, um, well, as I said, and as I pointed out in the chart, it's one of the cheapest things we've, we've seen, we've, we've, we've come across. It's very small. It's undercover but it generates a 25% free cash flow yield with 1.9 times net cash to, to EBITDA. That, that, that's a 51% free cash flow yield on, on enterprise value. Um, if, if no economic crash happens, we see cash flows of 11 million pounds very reasonable and with a market cap of 62 million, well, again, the yields are, are very high. Um, only Two sell side analysts are covering the, the company, Investec and FinCap. Investec Bank at the same time was uh, the sponsor and sole book runner in the IPO, and uh, we'll see it afterwards. But uh, the asset management part of Investec owns owns uh, around four or five percent of, of the company. Um, it has a low free float because if we add up the 41.5 percent of, of Sun Capital together with the rest of the insiders and with uh, the funds that own more than 3%, we've got or 2%, we get up to uh, only a 10% uh, free float. So we're here in front of a small, illiquid story, but very, very, very cheap. Um, okay, so let's go to the, to the long play story and let's dive into into the the business and the equity story of the company okay so let's start with some um some history um the company is very old it was founded in the in 1890 as a family business in the north of of england uh, in 1993 it was uh, there was a management buyout and, and the company started growing up to 95 stores in 2007. From there on, now they've got 90, 97 plus the House of Fraser concession, so hasn't grown much, hasn't expanded uh, much. And in 2008, with the economic downturn, um, well, as I said in the in the short equity story, um, well, credit insurance withdraw the credit, and and the company went very fast into bankruptcy. So Sun Capital bought the company for one pound and they injected 20 million pounds. Um, the company had in 2009 a market share of around 5% and it's grown up to 9.1% in the, in the sofa category and it has around 3% uh, in, the, um, in the flooring category. Um, with, with the introduction or with, with the entry of Sun Capital in the, in the, in the company, although they didn't change the management team, they started introducing some changes like third-party brands and trying to 
um, to to get into the more premium part of the business with the House of Fraser concessions. Uh, they also entered the, the flooring category uh, because they found some selling synergies and and they started increasing the the, the market share. Uh, say, as I said, in 2014, they reached a concession agreement with House of Fraser, 30 concessions, 28 now, um, and they relaunched the, the, the online store, which, as we will see, is, is not that important in, in, as a, in terms of sales, of revenues, but it's important as, as a marketing tool, as, as an image. Um, in 2015, the IPO the company for 1.75, uh, I, uh, Sun Capital I, um, cashed 35.7 million and they still maintain the, the rest, the 41.6% and the difference between the 51 they sold and the 41 they retain uh, is the, the insiders that hold shares. In 2016 it's true that they, they issued a kind of warning although um, they ended up growing 14.8% like for like and this shows that the company is volatile, is seasonal, and that there's not much visibility, and that uh, some issues such as Brexit can can stop for a few weeks uh, the consumption from people, and then the company can issue a warning, and then things can change again. So the market is very volatile, the the sales are very volatile, and and we ha we must live with it, okay? But we think there are things that that compensate for that. Um, okay, let me take out my screen. Um, as you can see here, um, and we go back to, to 2006 and 2007, uh, July 2007 when, when the company traded publicly was the last account we could find before, before the, the bankruptcy. And as we can see here in, in by the the end the year end is July so by the year end of 2007 July 2007 the company still held um, a net cash position so it wasn't an issue of of things going wrong I mean sales had started to fall but the company still had a solid balance balance sheet was still selling sofas things were working it was tough times but things were working, so um, here is, 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 is the, the proof that, that things were still uh, up and running. Um, as I was saying, the expansion of stores had, had gone more or less okay. There had been, apart from, from the sales downturn, some issues with the new warehouse processes and the IT systems, uh, but nothing really serious. No? Uh, I mean, what was serious was that sales were falling and credit insurance just panicked and, and, and cut all, all liquidity all liquidity to basically to suppliers. Um, this was again an industry-wide issue but here you find a difference with DFS. DFS at the time was also a private company um, and more or less during the years of recession the company DFS, not SES, DFS uh, increased their market shares and, and after that it was sold um, to Advent Capital. So uh, we think that, that DFS didn't do as bad and we don't know if it was a matter of size that like credit insurance didn't, didn't panic, um, but the thing is that in SES they panicked and Sun Capital um, was able to, to enter into a company which was good at, uh, at no cost. Uh, and injecting 20 million, which were never used. So uh, here is, is a detail. I mean, credit insurance represented around 20 million pounds of its cost of goods sold, which is 11% of total sales at the time. And now, just to give you an idea of, of how the company or how the business uh, and, and everything that, that surround the business has changed and has improved, now those 20 million are 12 million and sales have increased, so now credit insurance is only 4% of sales. So it's not only that SES has a good balance sheet, but also that, that suppliers are now much stronger and that are better prepared to, uh, for, a, for a downturn. Um, um, as I was saying, 
this is the, 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 the last point here is the most important. I mean, that the money that Sun Capital injected was never used. Okay, and I know I've repeated this like three or four times, but every time I think about it, I, I'm, I'm amazed. Um, so what did these guys do? Basically, they, yes, they saved the company. Uh, they did no changes in the management team, and they have helped um, to improve the strategy and, and, and the way that, that the company does, does the business. We met with Paul Zakos, which is the, the head of, of Sun Capital, and that's leading the, the investment in, in, in SCS. And we got a, a great image from what they've done, uh, why they are there, and of course we understand that now they started to sell. They started to sell at what we believe is a is a very cheap valuation, but their strategy is a private equity strategy. But um, we, we got a lot of confidence to understand that the business wasn't bankrupt because it was very weak or because there was some strange issue or, or because management weren't doing the right things. It, it was uh, mere bad luck at the end. I mean, it's, it's surprising to say, but, but it's, it's the opinion that we get. And, um, and we think that Sun Capital has, has helped a lot SCS. And we believe that having Sun Capital uh, as a partner has, uh, is good. It's good for, for us, minority shareholders, and for SES. So, so no problem with them. Um, we'll get back to Sun Capital at the end of the presentation to, to see what we think that can happen, can happen with, their, with their stake there. Um, the good thing about companies that go bankrupt is that there's always a, a lesson learned. And in these companies, in this company, especially, we believe that uh, having the, a higher or a more safer um, balance sheet in, in, the, in, the, in the suppliers has been key because it's what makes them bankrupt and is what now can make them bankrupt again. I mean, uh, now they've got ca more cash, they've got a, an unused uh, revolving credit line, but it, it's an issue there. I mean, your suppliers, work mainly for you, so you need them to be strong. Um, they've lowered their operate, operating leverage. Um, products at the same time are made to order, they get prepayments, they've got very low stocks, um, and basically the business is cyclical. Uh, they've got a negative working capital, which at the first glance is, glance is very good, uh, and of course, in general terms, with business as usual, it's great to have negative working capital. But at the same time, it means that you've got a, a risk, a hidden risk. I mean, you look at the balance sheet and you see the net cash position and you say, wow, this is great. But you have to take into account that some of that cash is prepayments and uh, that, that you still have to, to pay your suppliers. So when the cycle starts to turn around, that working capital you start to have less sales, but at the same time you have to pay for all the sales you did to your suppliers. So that working capital goes from negative to zero and can go to positive, so the impact in cash flow is, is negative. It can go very quickly, although afterwards it can stabilize, but the one-off that you get is really severe. So the good thing is that even taking out the working capital, you, you still have net cash. So we're comfortable with, with the balance sheet in the company. Um, and, and when looking at peers, I mean, and I've said that, that we're, we're also shareholders in DFS, we, we start buying both of them by the end of 2016. But uh, and DFS, it's a larger company. It has a greater mar market share. They produce, they're, they're a bit stronger, a bit I, want, I don't want to say a better company, but they're a bigger company. But they've got net debt and a higher negative net working capital. So the balance sheet, we don't feel as comfortable as with NCS, SCS in, in terms of, of, of balance sheet. Um, the business model is basically having stores in, in good selling areas, um, logistically well connected and located to competitors. Why? Because basically when you go to buy a sofa, 
um, you, you want to try it. You want to sit and you want to sit in several sofas and you very likely you are going to go to several stores. So if they're in the same um, in the same area, well, that, that's better for your client. And at the same time, DFS spends a lot of uh, money in advertising. So SES by being next to DFS can profit a little bit from their advertising. But um, that's that's another story that we'll talk in a while. Um, the thing here is that 45, almost half of the sales are, are financed by third parties. The products made to order, no inventory, um, all of the production outsourced. Most comes from the UK and the FX is um, the, the price of raw materials or, or FX from when, when suppliers have to buy in Asia. They are managed in terms of, you know, changing the, the specifications of the sofa a little bit, downgrading it a little bit in quality or in several things that, that the customer doesn't notice and that are not key, but maintaining the, the same the same price, which, which is the, the commercial attraction. And um, fixed costs are, are around 50% of general expenses and 18% of, of revenue, so around 80% of, of costs are, are variable. And as I said, it's an asset light model, which, which, which we like and which uh, gives you more, more flexibility in, in difficult times. Um, they did a joint venture with uh, Homo Fraser, which is an option to reach higher end customers with uh, very limited investment because it's more or less a, a variable cost, a variable rent uh, based on, on sales. And of course, you get higher margins with uh, higher priced products. And at the same time, you're accessing that market, which is good for the company. The flooring business generates more and more in-store synergies and, and, and more traffic. And, and the company is, and this is a difference to DFS, uh, they spend much less in, in marketing, which on the one side is, is good because uh, you save money. On the other hand, well, DFS here is the leader. DFS has 25% uh, market share, so so they they on the one side they have to maintain that and they have to spend a lot, and on the other side they they got more muscle and they've got more a higher margin to spend more on on advertising. And and what I was saying before on on the online, I mean the online is difficult that you buy a sofa or a couch online because you want to sit there, you want to you want to try it, you want to go to several different stores. Maybe you go, you try it in different stores and then you buy it online. Um, I'm not saying that's, that's the way, but basically what you do is that you start researching online. Okay, looking at the sofas, the ones you like, you go to DFS, you go to SES, you go to, to, to other um, companies. And after having looked at them online, then you go to the store. But so it's something that you need, but it's not like the big uh, door for for a growth in revenues. But you need it because it's a marketing tool. Um, one thing and, and to take my face from here. Um, one thing that is good is that the company has has all the stores uh, around the the, the UK, um, and it's it's. Uh, in, in the places that well, their clients are, so so most of the clients don't have to do a, a, a large driving distance. In terms of um, different kinds of, of stores, the, the, the big one is their own stores, or the, let's call them the, the SCS stores, not, not House of Fraser or not online. Um, they're, as I was saying, in convenient locations. They're mainly in, in out-of-town retail parks with, um, with where there's a, an anchor tenant, so they're not the guys that are driving the traffic into the, into the park, but, but another guy, and, and they benefit from that. They're close to competitors, DFS or, or other competitors, and they try to get uh, three-year paybacks from, from their investments. So, I mean, it looks rational. They haven't been growing crazy. They've, uh, they're opening three stores in 2017 to reach 100 stores, but um, they, they look very, very reasonable to us. In terms of marketing, as I was saying, 
they spend much less than 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 DFS, and they try to do it, you know, reasonably. I mean, TV, press, radio, but uh, they do it before the 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 weekend, especially because it's uh, when when people go to buy the sofa. So, well, makes makes a lot of sense. Here's the the range of products that they sell. Uh, we put here 200. And 99 to 3,000, and, and you see here that Lazy Boy goes up to 4.8 uh, thousand and hundred pounds. But um, but of course, all the, the the bulk of your of your clients stays here in the 300 to 3,000 range. Um, I'm going to take this away. These are the the main the main brands that they've got, um, and and these brands hold 9.1 percent of market share, as you can see. The, from SES, House of Fraser, and online, they've been growing since 2014 steadily, without growing in in, in new stores or, or anything special. So they've they've what they've done is that they've got more market share. It's true that some some competitors have have failed and have gone bankrupt, uh, and they've they've been able to to manage the, the business properly. Uh, the branded products are around 30% of the revenues, and then 11% of the revenues correspond to to the flooring business, which is around 2.3% of the market share. Um, when we look at, at the different sales platforms, as I was saying, you see that the stores are, are the key and are the bulk of the business, but House of Fraser is growing from 9 million to almost 13 million in, in 2017. And, and the online, well, it generates some business, but it's still growing, but uh, but from very low levels. And at the end of the day, you, you need to to sit on the sofa to see if you if you like it or not. This is basically the same the same chart as as the previous one, and just a bit of detail, more detail on House of Fraser. What this is doing is. Is, is allowing the company to grow into a different category at a very, very uh, low price or low cost for them, improving the customer awareness, like saying, oh, these guys know to do as well good sofas. Um, it's a commission-based rent, so pure variable cost, and, and of course, low capex, so, so we love this, these kind of, of initiatives. And in the online, well, as you see, only 3% of total revenues, as we were saying before, and and they they don't get as as much as market share of course because they've got all the all the physical platform in terms of clients as i was saying before as well 50 percent is uh, finance interest free um and with with an average or middle to low uh, class uh, profile of the client and here's an interesting point that People renovate the furniture every seven years, so it's not only a, a, an issue of, of growing of of, um, of of more houses, of, of building more houses, but that the people renovate every every seven years. So, well, there there could be a recurrent business to say so, but we know as well that those seven years, when things go wrong, can be very easily nine or ten because you can. You can extend the life of, of your sofa easily. It's not your main priority when, when you've got no job. Um, and it's a seasonal business. Um, from the, the, the peaks are from mid-September to mid-November. In January, the Boxing Day and till the end of the month, and then um, Easter and, and towards the spring are, are also very, uh, very strong uh, part of the year. This is what they do with, uh, or how they analyze their clients. They do uh, six different um, levels of, of types of people from A, which be the higher, most uh, um, uh, higher class to the E, which would be the lowest. And they say that they are from C1 to, to E. And what they say, which is very interesting, is that, um, and that's this is the location of, of the stores, is that 50% of the group's customer travel up to 14 minutes to visit that store and 80% up to 25 minutes. So this is the key of the company. I mean, that the stores are very well located and that people can, can, can
can travel very quickly to the stores and visit the stores. Um, the other thing is that uh, we were saying that management was good and that Sun Capital didn't change the management when they got into the company. They introduced Trustpilot in 2014 and they've got like 51,000 reviews uh, up to date and, and they've got five stars. I mean, this means that these guys are doing things correctly and properly and that clients are happy. So, so this is a very important thing to, to value the business and to understand that these guys continue to have clients because because clients are happy with the quality of the product and, 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 with, the, and with the service in, in store. Um, here, uh, as you see, Q2, 3 and 4 are, are the highest quarters and especially in Q4 it, it is important because it's the moment where um, during all of the quarters there's a difference in the investment in advertising with the actual sale and the actual final payment. Okay, so in July, by, by around May, June, they've done all the investment in advertising. In May, June, they've got a, a lot of sales and prepayments and they close July with a high level of cash. So we have to take into account that the level of cash that we see in, in July might be a little bit, not much, but a little bit um, high as, as they've cashed Many, much of, of the sales and they haven't paid uh, some of the suppliers. Um, what, how, let's get into detail of how they, how they cash. Uh, basically, they get a, a, a prepayment when the order is placed. It's 70% if the client is paying in cash and it's only 10% if the payment is, is financed. So given that 50% of the sales more or less are financed, you can do the maths there. Um, when they get the order, they order the, the, the sofa or whatever to the supplier, and the supplier manufactures it and delivers it. When SCS receives the product and the, uh, the customer pays before the delivery, of course, and if finance, SCS is paid seven or 10 days after the delivery to the client. However, SCS pays suppliers 45 days after receiving the product. So here's where you see um, the negative working capital. No inventories, the only inventories you've got is the, is the sofas or the, the things that you've got in, in, in store, but which are just you know a marketing tool. And, and, and you pay the suppliers 45 days after receiving the product. So, so it's, it's very well managed and, and, and very efficient uh, capital allocation. Um, the working capital, as I was saying, quarter by quarter, my my look bumpy because of the the advertising ex expenditure in in the different quarters and how they uh, how they um, cash and and the peak the peak moments of of sales. In terms of suppliers, and this is again a very important part of the business. Um, most of the supplier SES is number one client to most of its suppliers, well, they say except one, that we can only guess that their main client is uh, DFS. 80% of the suppliers are in the UK and 35% uh, and, and of the product is sourced from, from Asia. Okay, so the rest of the 20% some is sourced in Asia and the 80% the suppliers source some of that in Asia. Okay, so I was saying FX and raw materials are passed uh, through through wait, modifying the quality of the of the of the products, but maintaining the price. And they've got the after sales and repair services, the guarantees that are outsourced, and and the distribution is uh, done well with their own stuff and with leased bands because uh, this company has almost no assets. Okay, it's the leasing of of the of the stores and of of the vehicles. In terms of competitors, as I was saying, DFS 25%, 26% almost of uh, market share. They are the second ones, and they've got Harvey Sofa Works, and then half of, of their market is um, is very small um, uh, retailer, independent retailers. So, in this sense, we believe that both DFS and SES 
can can gain more ma market share if if the rest of small independent retailers um, have difficulties at, at, at some point or or just don't have the power to advertise us with such a strength such a strength as DFS and SES and you know people just go to the big ones at the end of the day. Um, doing a bit of financial analysis, we say here that 70% of the current cost base is variable. We said before it was 80%. Well, we want to be, uh, when we do our numbers and in, if there's a downturn, um, we want to be a bit conservative. So, so we assume 70% um, of the cost base is, uh, is variable. Uh, the good thing is that, I mean, cost of sales is a big part of, of costs, and that's, and that's variable. Uh, distribution costs, of course, are variable, and in terms of administrative expenses, marketing, uh, and stuff, there's a part of the, of the pay of, of, the, of the people selling in the stores which is variable. So, so a, a lot is variable. Our analysis indicates that if we had a year with around a 12% fall in sales, um, cash flow generated should be zero, included, including expansion capex. So it's quite a good figure and it shows the flexibility of, of the model and, and, and it should be capable of, of not incurring into great losses or great difficulties uh, with, uh, with a downturn. Of course, cyclical, and we will see. But the good thing is that it it doesn't affect the balance sheet enough to 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 take uh, the company to a bankruptcy. The leasing is something that, that we like to look, uh, especially now that uh, things in IFRS are gonna change. They've got a 10-year average leasing. Uh, the expenses around 23 million for the buildings and around two three million for for the vehicles. And and here the company shows the non the the aggregate of non cancellable leases, which is around 180 million. Um, we'll see, of course, next year if these or part of these uh, have to be capitalized and put into the balance sheet as as debt. Uh, the company uh, the balance sheet of the company will show a net debt position, but um, of course this is very much. Uh, an argument that, that we can discuss in another day. Um, again, credit insurance, take into account that's the main risk. Uh, suppliers are very much very better finance right now. And, and here's the exercise that we do. I mean, the company has 30 million net cash position. And it has an unused revolving credit facility of around 12 million. That's 42 million. So what do we do? Let's say, let's see um, how much are the short-term payables. So if we assume that we that they do not cash the 9 million that they've got in receivables, and we just wipe out the 23 million in inventories. Um, mainly come from, from financing companies that they would cash. I mean, with the net cash position and the revolving credit facility, they would have enough cash to pay all the payables and, and uh, assume all the inventories, okay? This is a very uh, aggressive sensitivity analysis because, of course, we assume that they would sell the inventories at whatever price uh, or whatever discount that they would sell the inventories and that they would cash the, they would cash the, the receivables, especially because well, it's only a small part. I mean, when the client comes with the cash, it has done a big uh, cash prepayment, and when it's a financing company, the financing company would pay, and, and the financing company or the credit insurance has to to assume the risk of of, of the client that pays them or not. So. So we really are very comfortable with the, with the balance sheet of the company. In terms of cash flow, let's see. We look for a, for a, for an EBITDA of around 16, 17 million with 2 million of, of taxes. There's no 
financial um, expenses because there's no debt. Here in working capital in, in 2016, there was a calendar issue that, that, that will affect positively this year. So we will see an operating cash flow and uh, at the end of the day, a free cash flow, which is much higher than we, what we can expect. But if you, can, if you do the maths with uh, zero working capital or slightly positive, because if you grow, uh, you will have a, a positive impact from, from working capital in the, in the cash flow. You should reach those 11, 12 million pre-expansion capex that we were talking about very, very easily. Okay. And um, the good thing is that stores are quite updated. There is no large investments expected or needed in IT, in warehouses, in anything. So, I mean, it's quite straightforward and, and should be quite quite simple. Um, I, we think this this is one of the of the most important slides in this presentation. We've done a, a comparison between SCS and DFS, and we've divided it in through three things. The first is balance sheet. Um, as I was saying, SCS has a net cash position, uh, and, and DFS has a higher negative working capital, which means that it's more efficient, but it also means that there's more risk if if uh, if a danger comes, so DFS is is as I said bigger, better, whatever you call it, company. Uh, they're very confident; things are working very well for them. But the risk is there, so just take it into account. For us, SCS is the winner in 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 the balance sheet uh, terms. In PNL, in PNL is much better DFS. Why? Well, basically because it has higher margins. Here we've, we've, we are showing the gross margin and the EBITDA margin and you see that especially in gross margin it's, it's crazy. Um, this is because uh, SES only accounts in, in cost of goods sold, the, the sofas that they buy to the suppliers, uh, but DFS accounts certain leases and certain um, staff costs so, so it's not comparable but the EBITDA margin is and the EBITDA margin is more than double in DFS. Why? Well, first, because uh, they've got some production um, that SES doesn't, so you get a higher margin from, from your own production, but basically it's because of the sales densities. Sales densities at, at DFS are double SES, and they're triple the next competitor. Okay, so it's not that SES is not good in terms of sales densities, it's that um, DFS are very, very good at this. Okay, and that's why they spend at the same time so much in advertising. So DFS is a very good business. It's very well managed. Um, we own the company as well. Uh, but now we turn to the third uh, um, theme, which is valuation. And when you see valuation, DFS is cheap. It's nine times PE, six times EV EBITDA, and especially it generates a free cash flow yield of, of nine, ten percent. But when you look at SES, again, two times EV EBITDA and the free cash flow yields of 20s to 40s, almost 50s percent. So it's it's crazy cheap. I mean, you can buy DFS, it's good business, but we think that the opportunity here is in, in SES. And why, why, why has the market created this opportunity? Well, we think it's size, it's too small, it's liquidity, it's too illiquid. Um, it comes from a bankruptcy, maybe people are more scared, you've got DFS and you prefer just prefer DFS, you don't want to have a problem with such a small company as SCS, but if you've got DFS in your portfolio, it's okay. And well, I, we don't know if maybe as well having um, some capital in the shareholder are, it's, it's an issue to, to hold back some shareholders thinking that they, they can do an accelerated book building or a placement. Um, as, as an example, as a matter of fact, when Advent placed DFS, the stock went up. We've seen this recently in, in some other stocks, when you see that there's no, mm, not so much risk when, when they do the first placement. So we'll see, um, but, but we think that there's an opportunity in SES. In terms of management, well, uh, I repeat myself again that, that uh, Sun Capital didn't change the management. David Knight, which is the uh, CEO, 
uh, I joined in, in 1988, so he has been in the company for, for a long time. Most of the management has been there for a long time, except Chris, who is the CFO, and, and he replaced the previous CFO who retired um, one year ago. Uh, Chris came from, from Norti, which is a big company, and he has a large experience in, in, in roles, in financing roles. And from our conversations with him, I mean, we think that he knows the business very well and that he, he, he manages uh, the company in a, in a great manner. Um, in terms of management pay, uh, as, as you can see, there's a long-term investment plan uh, with, um, uh, depending on, on, the, on the APS figures that the, that the, that the company attains. And, and of course, uh, the executive directors have an, an annual bonus based on on the on the EBITDA figure that the company reaches. So, so the good thing is that uh, directors and are aligned with with shareholders because it's uh, reflected on 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 the on the EBITDA basically and the EPS. Um, this is uh, we wanted to show you a bit of the uh, of the shares that each each man manager holds. Uh, the CEO holds 3.6%, uh, the ex-CFO hold uh, holds still 1.6%, uh, Chris still is, uh, doesn't appear as, as, a, as a shareholder, but there's a, an obligation uh, by the company that each executive director should have at least uh, one time their salary in, in shares in the company. Um, and, and then the senior managers, which is uh, managing directors, not executive directors, were assigned as well shares in, in the IPO process. So, so we like this. We like that managers have been here for a long time. We like that they, they've got skin in the game and that they're paid upon, upon EPS or, or EBITDA levels. Um, when you look at the rest of the, of the shareholders, um, you see several uh, funds uh, here that, that hold more than 2%, many holds 5 6%, even Artemis holds almost 12%. Here you've got um, part of pro product holding, which is uh, the company uh, that holds Sun Capital and, uh, the, um, and the insider trading. I don't know why uh, this appears here, and so I think this might be part of our stake. Uh, however, um, let's talk a bit of, of Sun Capital before we finish the presentation. They invested 20 million in 2008. As I said, they sold 51% for 35 million. Um, their stake is valued a bit under 30 million, and they cashed in dividends in, in around 13 million. 6.5 was uh, previous to the IPO, and 6.5 since since the IPO when when the company has been has been publicly traded because it pays a uh, very interesting uh, dividend yield around eight or nine percent at these uh, current prices. Um, so the cash proceeds that Sun Capital has has cashed in plus the the, the value of the current or uh, the price of the current stake is around 74 million, which is 3.7 times the invested capital, but in around nine years. So I mean, do we think that Sun Capital is gonna do a placement. I mean, after nine years, a private equity um, is more thinking about selling than buying, of course. But we would be surprised if 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 they sold at, at current prices. We think that they, when they did the IPO um, at the start of 2015, they, there was um, a short enough liquidity and markets weren't that good, so they had to lower the price, and they just wanted to do the IPO. But uh, I don't think that they would be selling at, at current prices. However, is it good or bad that Sun Capital sells? On the one side, we think it's, it could be a risk because they could do a placement with a discount. Um, but at the same time, I think that if we had a higher free float, it would be very good. So as it would allow more shareholders to get into the company, to analyze it, to talk about it, maybe more brokers to, to cover it. So we wouldn't view as, as, as a bad news that Sun Capital sold um, part of, of its 
of its stake. On the other hand, by having some capital, some capital has saved the company. So, I don't know, but imagine there's a big downturn with the Brexit. I mean, I prefer to have some capital in, in the company, uh, which might uh, maybe take some kind of action. But well, this is wishful thinking, and I hope uh, we, we've got no other information about about what could happen. Uh, but at the end of the day, we expect no downturn to happen. That, that would be better for everyone. <laughs> um, so conclusions: the company ticks many boxes. It's cheap on free cash flow terms. It has a sound balance sheet and used credit facilities. Management knows very well the business. Uh, they've gone through a bankruptcy and they've improved the financial situation of their selves and, and suppliers. It's an asset light model with very high returns on capital employed. Um, their market share is continuing to, to grow and there's little sell side coverage, which is, which is very good. And we think that at the same time people are looking at TFS and not many people have, have yet seen SES. On, on the negative part, we could say that um, they've got a high exposure to the UK cycle, so it's, it's very cyclical and we'll see what, what happens with the, with the Brexit eventually. Um, the good thing is that they've, most of the revenues come from across the country. They're not focused or you know, concentrated in one city such as London, which could, who knows, be the, the most affected by a Brexit. So, so that's something to, to have into account. Um, clients buy on credit, so that indicates that if there's a downturn, more people would hold back or, or the banks or the financiers would be more strict in, in terms of, of giving new credit. Negative working capital can change quickly, but um, with business as usual, it's, it's, a, it's a positive. And the stock has very low liquidity. That, of course, is a, is a negative. Um, and what we've just discussed, not that some capital could do a placement, but uh, we, we believe that could be even good news. So this is our, our idea. On SCS, this is how we've analyzed it and how we look at things. We wanted to show this idea because it's very specific on what we look at, which is basically free cash flow and good balance sheet and a business that is working. And uh, we hope you've liked it. If you have any comments, please do write us on on the channel or or through our contact uh, form in the in the web at valentum.es. Thank you very much.